Father's Arms Fellowship. Praise the Lord, we're here on a Sunday night. Feasting on the Word. We're feasting on the Word.
Does that just come on and you just want to sing? That was in the last one, wasn't it, dear? Well, that was, but I was just singing that one. Oh, my. Hey, me, Dad. So I would have been done earlier. But it's amazing how, it's amazing how there's so much in the scriptures in just the first nine chapters of the book of Genesis. I mean, there's just, it's mind boggling to me uh, the richness of the book, you know. And uh, I hope I've done it uh, honorably, and I hope that uh, you've taken something out of this that will 
that you've learned something from. But we're finishing up Noah, and uh, Noah will be it for this study in Genesis, and then uh, we're going to start Ephesians in 2024 sometime. So as always, we start by uh, the reading of the Word, and so we're going to have Genesis chapter 9 read to us. So God blessed Noah and his sons, being fruitful and multiplied, and filled the earth. And the fear of you and the dread of you shall be on every beast of the earth, on every bird of the air, on all that move on the earth, and on all the fish of the sea. They are given into your hand. Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. Surely for your lifeblood I will demand a reckoning. From the hand of every beast I will require it, and from the hand of man. From the hand of every man's brother, I will require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God, he made man. And as for you, be fruitful and multiply. Bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply in it. And as for me, Behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you, Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. This is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you, and every living creature that is with you, for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud. And it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be, when I bring a cloud over the earth, that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud, and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. This is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Cain. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk, and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. 
So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be King Noah. A servant of servants he shall be to his brethren. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem. And they came on being his servants. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. was in the ark for over a year. And then they got out and the first thing that Noah did is he made a sacrifice to God and God reestablished his covenant with some modifications. Now, God did not create the earth to be a beautiful ornament of his creation. But according to Isaiah 45, verse 18, this is what he created it for. For thus says the Lord, who created the heavens, who is God, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited, I am the Lord, there is no other. So the Lord created the earth for the express purpose of it to be inhabited. I like that. And, And so he would have a means to display his love and grace. That's an awesome God. That is a a truly awesome God. So God says to Noah and his sons, as soon as they establish, after the the sacrifice and the altar, he tells Noah and his sons, be fruitful, increase the number, and fill the earth. And then God emphasizes something really important here, the sanctity of human life. So to emphasize the preeminence of humans, God tells them, The fear and dread of you will fall upon all the beasts, including the birds and the fish. So, it basically it's it's a it's a means of protection because the wild animals, which would multiply far more rapidly than humans, could have easily exterminated the humans. Because remember, just because God wiped everything out, sin was not wiped out. Nope. And so we got to remember that. And so to show humans are a higher level of life, God says, this is important, everything that lives and moves will be food for you. Just as I gave you the green plants, I now give you everything. Now, Adam and Eve were vegetarians. All right? Now, all animal life is available to supplement the human diet. Well, what about clean and unclean? Well, we haven't quite got there yet. I believe God established it with Adam and Eve, but it really doesn't say anything. Now, is that is that that big a deal? Well, some will probably make it a big deal. But God basically says, all that lives will be food for you. All right? So, probably anticipating false future belief, or future false beliefs, God makes a vast distinction between humans and animals. And it clearly reveals a foul, the fallacy of those who basically equate animals with humans claiming animals should have equal rights. Now, should we abuse animals? No. But, you know, if PETA wants to be PETA, that's fine, but they're putting their PETA above God. And, you know, those who hug the trees, hey, if they want to hug a tree and get splinters, that's perfectly fine with me. But, the tree is not God. God made the tree that they're hugging. God is still God. All right. So, um, but the thing about it is, such views like this, it denies the fact that only humans are made in the image of God. Now, we've all got those animals that, you know, dogs or cats or whatever, that 
that dude, you know, that give you that look, you know, and, and, you know, kind of give you that human kind of look, but no, they're just animals, you know, uh, but since God made humans above the animals, it also is a death blow to reincarnation because, you know, it basically the way I understand reincarnation and according to Pastor Tommy Heidel here, he says, it teaches you that humans with bad karma comes back as animals. Aww. Yeah, you know. <laughs> now. And we know those animals aren't as bad as those people are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, even those stinking snakes, right? Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Now, vegeta vegetarianism is not commanded in the scripture anywhere. Now, I will say, though, when we get to heaven, the new Jerusalem, and you see all those trees of life that produces a new fruit every every 30 days, there won't be no more holy bird in heaven, Dermot, unless God chooses to create those fruit in the form of a chicken leg, a fried chicken leg. Amen, you know, brother. amen brother, right? Now... <clears throat> Under the under the new covenant, we we can we're free to eat any meat we choose, or refrain from eating any food for health and personal reasons. All right. Now, but look what Galatians five verse thirteen says: For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but um, through love serve one another. Now. If you want to be a vegetarian, be a vegetarian. I got no problem. I got no problem um, with someone who wants to be a vegetation. That just means more steak for me. Okay. Vegetation. Yeah, vegetation. Yeah. Now I, I listen. I like my vegetables just like anybody else, with the exception of Brussels sprouts and asparagus. And you know, of course, like. Uh, well, that's not a vegetable. That's just a, that's just an inhuman form of vegetation. <laughs> okay, sauerkraut. She said, Ugh. I used to like it when I was a kid. All right, so. came the fall. Did they? <coughs> yes. Okay, Brussels sprouts. Okay, okay. God just revealed to Pastor Kid that Brussels sprouts came with the fall. Okay, so you've heard it on Facebook. Uh, said all. Said all. Uh, Send all rebuttals to Pastor Kid at AOL.com. Okay, anyway, but, alright, I have no problem if you want to be a vegetarian. You know, and I don't have any problem if you want to eat meat. Just don't make it your God. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, well, you know, the thing about it is, we, you know, we, used, we have a friend named Julian, and when we first met him, when we were going to Elmo Baptist up here, he was a vegetarian. I don't know why. But every time we'd, we'd have a Wednesday evening meal and he'd go for the cookies, I'd go, Julie, there's lard in them cookies. You know? Which he's like, shut up! Shut up! Yeah, praise the Lord, right? <laughs> praise, praise the Lord. Pass the, the chicken leg. Okay, yeah. But, here's what God says involving me. Alright, and this is really, this is important. God says, but you must not eat meat that has its lifeblood still in it. All right, that's very important. That's in verse 4. Because the blood represents life, they were to drain the blood from a slain animal and not eat it or drink it. A lot of pagan religions would drink the blood thinking that it would extend their life. No. It just shortened it, really. Um, the word lifeblood implies... An important physical truth that wasn't discovered, actually, until the 1620s when English physician William Har Harvey discovered the circulation system. God, of course, God created it. He knew it. But it took, to, it took you know, to the 1620s to figure out that we have a circulatory system and how it all works out. And we're finding more and more cool stuff, what God did with the blood, with our blood and all that. And what I, everything it does, that's just kind of neat. And Harvey's discovery became a foundation for modern medicine because it was understood that blood is critical for the preservation of life. So before that, what, what doctors would do is they would remove the blood from the sick through a bleeding process. 
Uh, apparently, uh, our founding father, George Washington, that's what happened to him, apparently. They sucked too much blood out and killed him. Oh. So, too much leeching. Too much leeching, yeah. Leeching. Which, which is, uh, which is kind of, you know, but praise God, praise God, we've discovered different things now. So, science in itself is not bad, except when people try to use false pseudoscience to, to, to try to explain God away. And at the end of the night, we're going to see something really cool, which proves God God will never be taken away. He just won't have it. All right? So, uh, look with me at Leviticus 17, verse 11, where it says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood. All right? We just talked about that, right? And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. All right? That's why Jesus had to shed his blood. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, exactly. So, though God had destroyed the earth by the flood and now allowed the killing of animals for food, he did not want to want to think he views human life as cheap. All right, this is very important. Therefore, he says, and this is in nine, chapter 9, verses 5 and 6, where he says, and, and for your life blood, I will surely demand an accounting. Here's what he says. Whoever sheds the blood of man... By man shall his blood be shed, for in the image of God, God has made man. God has made man. That's the death penalty, folks. And we can try to explain it away, but God says, if you murder someone, your life should be taken. Now, for example, though, if it's like a manslaughter or something like that, if you look at the sanctuary cities and all that, there was a way out of that. Okay? But if you if I intentionally kill Pastor Ken, my life is to be taken. And if there was two witnesses. Well, that's not what it says, though. No, but it, I mean, that, that, that's part of the, the commandment. If there was a dispute, if yeah. Uh, so anyway, so for all those who. Um, or against the death penalty, just take it up with the Lord. This is what he says. All right? But then God says, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and increase. And as a result, basically, um, the population has grown from eight to several billion <clears throat> over, a, a of, over a few thousand years. Oh, my. You know, um, so this goes to show us that God values human life, and as followers of God, we should value human life too. Amen. All right. So now let's look at the sign of the covenant. All right. Do you think that the flood was a traumatic experience for Noah and his family? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Being in the ark over a year, not seeing any daylight, per se, <clears throat> floating around. I wonder if any of those, I wonder if there any of those guys were seasick. <laughs> Doesn't say, but you never know. But it had to be a traumatic experience for them. People that they knew were no longer around. The earth that they had known was not there anymore. It was all new and different. And the scars of the flood experience are probably the reason for the repetition of the word covenant, which is used seven times in verses 8 through 17. What's God's favorite number? Seven. 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 That's just one of those little nuggets I love, you know. Now, did God... Did God say, hmm, I think I'm going to put seven in there somewhere. Well, maybe he can do what he wants. He's God, right? But I, I did think it was interesting that, that he said that he said the word covenant seven times. I think that I think it's important. But he says, I will now establish my covenant with you and, and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that was with you. Never again will all life be cut off by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now in verse 12 it says, 
that the covenant is for all generations to come. And God sets a rainbow as a sign or reminder of that covenant. Circumcision would be the sign of the covenant with Abraham, according to Genesis 17. And then what, what do you think the sign of the covenant with Israel would be? Well, you'll find that in Exodus 31, 16 and 17, where it says, Therefore the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Forever. All right. For six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Isn't that interesting? So the sign of the covenant was the rainbow. The sign of the covenant for Israel was the Sabbath. I think it's kind of interesting. Okay, now... Now we're going to get to uh, a part that can cause a lot of controversy. We're not going to go there, but we are going to go there. The sin of Noah. So verses 18 and 19, it tells us that from the three sons of Noah came all the people that were scattered over the earth. Now to this point, after the flood... They established, them, they, they established themselves. Noah's having a pretty good life, all right? Uh, you know, he, uh, he became a farmer. And he planted stuff, but he planted a vineyard, according to 9 verse 20. Because as he, he basically followed what his father was, who was a farmer. Lamech was a farmer. And so it says that he plants this vineyard, and it says, Noah drank wine, became drunk, and he came <clears throat> covered inside his tent. All right. Now, the wine that they made back then is nothing like it is today. Mm -hmm. But they still had to ferment it to keep it because they didn't have refrigerators. So, um, but the fact of it is still had alcohol in it. <laughs> Noah drank the wine. We don't know how many times it just says this particular time he got drunk and basically laid naked in his tent. All right. And it makes you wonder why God would do, you know, why God would bring up this point. Okay. Well, because God tells the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And basically, the inclusion of things like Noah getting drunk and getting, you know, laying naked in his tent, God's trying to show us that these heroes in the Bible were human just like we are. And they made huge mistakes just like we do. And, and so that alone should tell us that the Bible is the inspired word of God because if it were written, written by uninspired men, they would have covered this up. All right. These are the verses where basically Ham goes in and finds his dad naked. All right. And these are the verses that people claim where homosexuality started. And Maybe they have good reason to say that, but we're we're going to we're not going to really get into this a whole lot, other than to say that this verse reveals that no one is above falling into sin. All right, so you know I realize that you know because when when people do sins against their body, there's a it, it causes some big issues. All right, but the bottom line is sin is sin, and I don't see anywhere in the scripture where God has a top ten sin list. In other words, you know, murder number one, homosexuality number two, blah 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 blah. I don't see anywhere where it says, and the penalty is this, and the penalty is this. What I do see is everyone sins and falls short, falls short of the glory of God, and the wages of that sin is death. All right. Yep. So saying that. That's why we're not going to get into this too much. I mean, there's a, 
I mean, you can go for months on this. It's not that important in this context. Other than sin is sin, and the wages of that sin is death, and that's where we're going to let it go. Fair enough? Yeah. But the thing about it is, at any age in our spiritual life, we can fall into sin. So what do we do when that happens? First John 1 John 1.9, how many times do you ever quote this during this study? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now Satan tried to bring down Noah, Moses, David, and Solomon, and he can do the same for us. However, we need to remember that our God not only saves, but restores. Amen? Amen. All right, and if God used only perfect people, who would he use? Well, nobody. Nobody, nobody. Because none of us are perfect. But God can use us anyway. Even if we sin, if we take advantage of that promise for cleansing and restoration. All right. Now, now, here's the cool part, and I'm waiting on my buddy Zach. Hey, Zach! Zach's got to have he's he's got my last part ready, but I got but I got to get him in here. <laughs> anyway, do you? He may have a little potty. Anyway, do you guys remember? I I, I want to close with this because we spent so much time on um, the creation story itself. We spent. I think 12 or 13 lessons just on the creation part of uh, of uh, Genesis. And do you remember, I talked about this this morning, but do you guys remember when we talked about the beetle that farts fire? Okay, do you all remember that when we talked about the beetle? Oh, that's the only thing I remember. Yeah, well... <laughs> You know what can I say? You know, every man, every man loves a good fart joke. I'm sorry, that's just the way it is. We cannot help ourselves. But we talked about, we talked about the beetle that, that farts fire. All right. And we had a lot of fun with it. Okay. But as a result of that, we did see how cool our board is and how he can do some amazing things with this creation. Remember? But we're going to end this series with a, a another look at another amazing look at one of God's amazing creations, the pistol shrimp. Now this comes this comes from uh, from uh, Calvin Smith and Answers in Genesis Canada.org. They're, they're affiliated with the with the, the ark, the ark there, the answers in Genesis ark in Louisville, but they're out of Canada. And the gentleman's name that, that's going to be speaking is uh, Calvin Smith, and we had another one of his videos way earlier. But um, I really want you to see this. When I saw this, of course, this just really blew my mind. And so this is about 10 minutes long, and then, and then and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit. But Go ahead and hit it, Zach. This this is cool. Canadian. Do you feel that was more because of your own personality or maybe your family circumstances or some combination of both? Well, probably both. People. I'm actually quite introverted. And obviously growing up in the 70s in northern Ontario was certainly a different time from now. After having three children of my own and knowing the busyness of looking after a young family, I, I can't even imagine what it was like for my parents with seven of us running around. All to say, it was a lot easier for me back then to slip away on a Saturday afternoon to the local cinema to watch an inexpensive matinee than it would likely be for a child with helicopter parents today. I could disappear for a couple of hours without anyone even knowing I'd been gone. And do you think that influenced your thinking significantly? Oh, for sure. I think media has a tremendous impact on people. And I think there was a lot that I took in that I probably shouldn't have that was pretty negative. But I also believe that God can use even very evil things or bad influences or experiences to draw people to him. 
even if it isn't obvious how that might have even worked at the time. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, verse 28. Whether it was the adventures of Sinbad with great stop-motion animation by Ray Harryhausen, Young Jim's swashbuckling adventures on Treasure Island, or a raucous spaghetti western with guns blazing, it seemed I could always find something at the local theater to fire my imagination that way. And I particularly remember the first time I saw a young Clint Eastwood saunter on screen with that lethal gaze and slightly raised eyebrow. You just knew the bad guys were in trouble when he showed up as he eased his poncho away from his side and revealed his sidearm slung real low. Surprisingly, there's an undersea equivalent to Clint's generic gunslingers in the form of a little shrimp, only a few inches long, called a pistol shrimp. And what differentiates these shrimps from their common counterparts is that they have one regular claw and one oversized claw that functions like an acoustic gun. Literally cocked and fired like a pistol, capable of producing shots reaching over 200 decibels. That's far louder than an actual gunshot, which averages around 150 decibels, and even a jet engine. The blast is produced by a bubble formed by a fast water jet, traveling at speeds up to 100 kilometers or 60 miles per hour, squeezed out from a socket in the claw when its wow. larger pistol claw snaps shut. The snap generates a low-pressure bubble and causes a violent implosion. The cavitation bubble produces the sound blast along with a pressure strong enough to kill a small fish. Researchers have used high-speed cameras and sound equipment to observe the process, which occurs within 300 microseconds after the shrimp pulls the trigger. Incredibly, the implosion also briefly generates a temperature of about 4,500 degrees Celsius, which is nearly as high as the sun's surface. Unlike the stand-up stalwart cowboys on screen, pistol shrimp tend to be more like the belligerent bushwhackers the cowboys contended with. These shrimpy sharpshooters tend to hide and ambush victims, which wind up at the wrong end of this cocked and triggered gun barrel. Not only does the implosive force knock out prey to then be devoured, but it can also drill into rock to make hideouts. This biological technology has even inspired scientists to try to replicate it for drilling rock as well. Pistol shrimps have another clever trick up their sleeve, their ability to switch hands. Mm -hmm. Research has shown that should something chop off a shrimp's pistol hand, the missing limb will regenerate, growing into a regular smaller claw while its undamaged normal appendage will morph into a new snapping claw. Cutting the nerve of a snapping claw induces the conversion, changing the regular limb into another gun claw. Some shrimps are like the two-gun pig, bearing a pistol claw on each arm, making them notoriously hard to disarm. Pistol shrimp tend to congregate in shallow water and produce an underwater symphony of sound that can be deafening in its density. The shrimp's snapping is the dominant source of background noise in the shallow ocean. In fact, they are so loud that in World War II, submarines took advantage of these underwater noise machines to prevent being detected. When colonies of the shrimp snap their claws, the cacophony is so intense submarines can take advantage of it to hide from sonar. As a team, they are so loud that they can easily compete with the noisiest heavyweights in the sea rowdier than 40-ton whales. Their gunshots are used not only to attack and burrow, but to communicate. The obvious design features in such a creature are astounding. Evolutionists have only weak attempts to explain how the building of a sonic gun, along with the biochemical and neural pathways integrated into the creature's central nervous system to function properly, via mutations and natural selection, supposedly somehow occurred. All we've known until now is the endpoint of these super snapping claws, said Rich Palmer, biological science professor at the University of Alberta and senior author on a new study on snapping shrimp claws. 
What we now know is that a series of small changes in form led to these big functional changes, which essentially allowed the shrimp the ability to break water or snap. But how did they know? They certainly didn't observe it happen. And remember that evolution requires small changes that must provide a survival benefit to the organism in order for it to be preserved. Arch evolutionist Richard Dawkins admits, there cannot have been intermediate stages which were not beneficial. There's no room in natural selection for the sort of foresight argument that says, well, we've got to let it persist for the next million years and it'll start becoming useful. That doesn't work. There's got to be a selection pressure all the way. Now the pistol shrimp's claw is an extremely specialized construct requiring precision design in order to function. As one evolutionary research paper put it, key functional transitions between ancestral, simple pinching, and derived, ultra-fast snapping claws were achieved by minute differences in joint structure. Therefore, subtle changes in form appear to have facilitated the evolution of wholly novel functional change in saltational or stepwise manner. But let's think this through. Of the millions of mutations that might randomly occur that could alter the shape of a claw and produce some kind of bump or protrusion or indentation of some sort, what survival benefit would those small shape changes have benefited to shrimp while becoming a sonic claw? There would be precious few that would even be remotely helpful in becoming a sonic claw, let alone ones that would simultaneously provide some other benefit in the meantime before the sonic gun variant arrived. A similar example of this erroneous evolutionary view is how scales on a lizard-like creature supposedly turned into feathers on birds. Richard Dawkins discussed this idea in an interview with TV show host Jonathan Miller, where he said that one has to imagine that as the scales change slightly, they would become something like a small bump or pimple before becoming a feather. But to his credit, during the discussion, Miller asks what the advantage of a pimple might be for a lizard on its way to becoming a bird. Dawkins' reply is revealing indeed. There's got to be a series of advantages all the way in the, in the feather. If you can't think of one, then that's your problem, not, well, not natural selection's problem, natural selection. Um, uh, well, I suppose that is a sort of matter of faith on my, on my right. part, since the theory is so coherent and so, and so powerful. Contrary to the more sanguine evolutionists we quoted in part four of our series, Dawkins admits that the methods of natural selection don't allow for a form to foresee future mechanisms that would be useful down the evolutionary road. But even though he can't explain the course of natural selection, he holds to his faith that it somehow happens. Faith in the story of evolution, not the fact of evolution or the supposed science of evolution. The storytelling of evolutionary ideas has never been observed. According to Dawkins, biology is the study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed. But the better explanation is that things that look designed were designed. Trying to explain away examples of design with just-so stories rather than observable evidence isn't just faith, it's blind faith. A stupefaction that happens when intelligent people deny God. If the story of evolution is supposed to be scientific, why does it require such a massive amount of faith in things unseen to explain it? Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Romans 1, verse 22. Amen. <clears throat> and that make a lot of sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So I guess it goes to show you that an evolution has faith. Exactly. But here's here's my thought. Here's my thought. Faith in the theory. It takes more faith. It takes more faith to not believe in God. Amen. Than it does to it really, believe. It really does. I've done both. You know, and, and so when you look at it. When you look at it, science is proving more and more every day 
that there's a designer. Oh, yes, there is. And God has designed everything. Yeah. Amen. And he designed it for his pleasure, not ours. Right. And he has decided that because he wanted his earth inhabited, that he designed you and me at this particular time, in this particular space in Scott City, in the year 2023. Most of us are faithful believers in Yeshua and Jesus. But he's showing us more and more and more who he is and why he did what he did. And just like we talked last week in the in the uh, in the morning ser in the morning sermon about um, being encouraged, being part of the remnant, this should encourage us because even though it seems to be there's more opposition to uh, God as a whole, God keeps proving Himself in the little things over and over and over, and I think He does it. To encourage us. He doesn't have to. But he chooses to because he loves us. And there's so much stuff that we're starting to see in these last days about who God and who he really is. That maybe we ought just to take a moment just to praise him. And thank you, Lord Jesus. We praise your holy name for uh, this study. We thank you so much that you loved us and you're showing us great and mighty things. And we just praise your holy name and give you all the glory in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Praise God. All right. Now, uh, this is it for 2023. When we start again in 2024... Going to just going to uh, Ephesians. Mm -hmm. Pastor and our first uh, first service mm -hmm. will be what's the date? Uh, mm -hmm. the, the twelfth, I guess, because we're gone that weekend before. We're gone weekend before. So it'll be the twelfth of January, <coughs> and then we will start brand new in Ephesians. So everybody on Facebook, are you guys here? Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, Happy Hanukkah. Love y'all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.